Good morning. Can you hear me? Yeah, but that's, yeah, of course you can because you said good morning back. <laughs> kind of obvious. <laughs> if you're new here among us, my name is Gene and I serve here at C3 Church as your lead pastor. And I am excited to be in our epic Jesus League series this morning. This is where we are looking at the New Testament authors of the Bible, who they were and what they wrote. We began with the four gospel accounts. These are biographies of the life and ministry of Jesus Christ, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When we covered Luke, we also covered Acts. Why? Because Acts was written by Luke. It is a history of the early church. We also looked at Paul and his very important books or letters, 13 of them written to different churches and different people. Titus and Timothy were among them. We looked at Titus last week. Even though Titus isn't a writer of anything in the Bible, he is an important part of that Jesus League. We talked about the importance of being good witnesses through good behavior. This week, we'll be looking at James <clears throat> and the sin of partiality. But first, who is James? The James that we're talking about this morning is not the James that dies by the sword in Acts chapter 12. He is Jesus's brother, James, or Jimmy. That's what Jesus used to call him. Notes on that in the app, if you're paying attention. He's not one of the original 12 apostles. Note how he describes himself. James 1.1, 1, 1, from James, a slave of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes who are scattered outside the land of Israel, greetings, exclamation point. His greeting lacks the title of apostle that Peter and Paul ascribed to themselves when writing letters. James was the overseer of the church in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was kind of the mother church back then. And we talked about Acts 15, where James makes a really important decision there. I told you we'd be talking about it today, so I will. <laughs> this way later to be called Christianity, was at first comprised of mostly Jewish believers. Jesus was the Jewish Messiah. And so, naturally, a question comes in when the Gentiles, who are brought in a little bit later, when they come in, the Jewish people naturally say, well, do the Gentiles, who are not Jewish, need to become Jewish first? This would include circumcision. We talked about Timothy having to get circumcised, and Titus, I guess, gets off the hook there on that one. <clears throat> but we talked about that. So Paul, Barnabas, and Titus go to Jerusalem to check it out. They ask the question, do the Gentiles need to become Jewish essentially first? They follow the law of Moses, get circumcised. Even Peter is there. They debate about it. Ultimately, James is the one who makes the final decision. No, they do not. And all of a sudden, there's a flood of men joining Christianity. <coughs> it's actually kind of historically true. More woman, women would be willing to convert in that time to Judaism, that is, not Christianity. Yeah, who wants to go through that? We also see James in the Gospels, most likely here in John chapter 7, starting at verse 1. After this, Jesus traveled through Galilee. He didn't want to travel in Judea because the Jewish authorities wanted to kill him. When it was almost time for the Jewish festival of the booths, Jesus' brother said to him, Leave Galilee. Go to Judea so that your disciples can see the amazing works that you do. Those who want to be known publicly don't do these things secretly. Since you can do these things, show yourself to the world. His brothers said this because even they didn't believe him. They were mocking him. So this is a drastic turnaround like there was with Paul. We know that Jesus' family rejected him. Look at Mark 6, starting at verse 1. Jesus left that place and came to his hometown. His disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were surprised. Where did this man get all of this? What's this wisdom he's been given? What about the powerful acts accomplished through him? Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? That's not Judas who betrayed him. Aren't his sisters here with us? They were repulsed by him and fell into sin. Jesus said to them, Prophets are honored everywhere except in their own hometowns, among their relatives, 
and in their own households. So this reversal is remarkable. He goes from Jesus' brother mocking him to a very important church leader. This was an important decision that James made about the circumcision. Paul writes a lot about it. It's a big, big deal. He's so important that the first century historian, Josephus, takes the time to write about him. Christian apologists, those who are defending the Christian faith, love Josephus because Josephus helps back up a lot of the things that we see in our biblical account for those who are going to doubt it. He backs it up. He wrote around the time that Jesus was alive, I believe somewhere between 30 A.D. and 100 A.D. is when he lived. So here's some background. <clears throat> the Jews are under Roman occupation, so there's different Roman governors that are coming in and out of the story. They have client kings, so you hear about kings, the Jewish kings back then. They don't really have any power. They're under the control of these Roman governors. And in Acts, from 24 to 25, we see a changing of these governors. Felix is replaced by Festus. And Josephus writes about it. He writes this, Festus was now dead, and Albinus was but upon the road. So he assembled the Sanhedrin of judges and brought before them the brother of Jesus, who was called Christ, whose name was James, and some others. And when he had formed an accusation against them as law, uh, breakers of the law, he delivered them to be stoned. He gets stoned to death. Think about that. Imagine that. Your brother says he's God. Right? You're mocking him. But you're so convinced later on that he is God by his resurrection that you're willing to die instead of refusing to believe that he's God or proclaim him as God. This is an incredible reversal. This is an artifact, if we can get it. Did I give it to you? Yes, I did. <clears throat> it's believed to be James's coffin or an ossuary. It stores bones. On it, you can't really see it from that distance. It says, James, the son of Joseph, Joseph, brother of Jesus. What did James write? The book or letter of James. It's a five-chapter letter. It resembles a bunch of snapshots of Jesus' teaching and the Proverbs. He writes about the power of the tongue. He talks about faith versus works. And then ultimately where we're going this morning, the sin of partiality. So many of you who know me know that I grew up in a Catholic church. <clears throat> I didn't grow up in a Bible-believing household. If you've been to a Catholic church, you know it's very formal. There are lots of different traditions, and those traditions are placed very high, I would say, above the Bible. I know I didn't read it growing up, so those traditions must be very important. I got all dressed up for church. I wish I had a picture of it, because it's kind of funny, actually. <clears throat> Sometimes I would wear a three-piece suit. I know some of you would really enjoy that. It's too hot. This is about as dressed up as I get. A three-piece suit with a fedora, for those of you who are old enough to know what that is, when it got cold, or an overcoat in the cold weather. It was really important, <clears throat> the traditions, that is. But, as dressed up as we all got, <laughs> on the inside we were still the same. Sometimes there would be arguing in the car on the way to church. While I was at church, I wasn't thinking about Jesus. I was thinking about the cherry danish that I was going to get at the bakery afterwards, waiting for the priest to be done. If he went too long, people would eye roll him, make noises. It wasn't very honoring. Sometimes on the way back, we would be arguing again. We weren't reading the Bible during the week or thinking too much about Jesus. It doesn't matter how we dress ourselves up for church when we're faking it when we're living in an unrighteous way or treating each other poorly when we leave. Look what God says through the prophet Amos about that. Amos 5, 21. I hate, I reject your festivals. I don't enjoy your joyous assemblies or church. If you bring me your entirely burnt offerings of gifts and food, I won't be pleased. I won't even look at your offerings of well-fed animals. Take away the noise of your songs. I won't listen to the melody of your harps, but 
Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Isaiah says something similar. Isaiah 1, starting at verse 13. Stop bringing your worthless offerings. Your incense repulses me. New moon, Sabbath, and the calling of an assembly. I can't stand wickedness with celebration. I hate your new moons and your festivals. They become a burden that I'm tired of bearing. When you extend your hands, I'll hide my eyes from you. Even when you pray for a long time, I won't listen. Your hands are stained with blood. Wash, be clean, remove your ugly deeds from my sight. Put an end to such evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Help the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. Proverbs 15.8 says, The Lord detests the sacrifices of the wicked, but favors the prayers of those who do right. James echoes Jesus, the prophet's, in the Proverbs, in his letter, James 1, verse 27, true devotion, the kind that is pure and faultless before God the Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their difficulties and to keep the world from contaminating us. God sees our heart and he desires loving interactions with one another. He wants consistency between our actions inside the church and outside the church, regardless of our social or religious status. We spoke of our deeds matching what we're saying last week. God hates lip service and fake worship. Additionally, God hates division and partiality. When we force people, like I was describing, to get all dressed up for church, we're creating a standard that some can't meet, which leads to division and partiality. What if I can't afford nice clothes? Define nice clothes. Maybe what I'm wearing is nice to me, but rags to someone else. Those of you who know me <clears throat> know I'm a sandals and shorts kind of guy. <laughs> I don't dress like this during the week. At most, I wear a polo shirt here at work for the staff meetings and things. But I get dressed up in this on Sunday. And some might be looking at me saying, well, where's the Armani? Where's your suit? So where does it stop? Those of you who were with us for a long time or have heard the stories know that we had a traditional service at our other building. <clears throat> we had two services. We were schizophrenic. <laughs> we had a modern service and a traditional service, yes. And leading worship in both of them makes you a little crazy. That's how I got like this. I used to lead worship. <laughs> no, <clears throat> I got dropped on the head. Um, I used to lead worship in the traditional service. It was Pastor Wayne, our overseer now, his vision to blend the service. He's saying, look, the traditional service is dying. You guys have to be modern. He wanted it all like this to attract new and younger people in. So. He sent me in to help lead worship in the traditional service, leading worship in some modern songs. So I figured people didn't want to see my ugly feet, my hairy legs, or my spider tattoo. So I dressed up like this. And I thought I was doing a really good job. This is great, because these are nice clothes to me. Well, not everybody agreed. One morning I was getting ready to lead worship, and I actually got yelled at by a member for wearing dungarees. For those of you who are young, that is jeans. <laughs> what I saw is really nice work clothes. It was an older gentleman, right? So he saw me as like a gold miner or something like that. I think that's how, why denim was invented. And that's what he was thinking of. You wear these to work. Think about it. So where does it end? Where? It doesn't. And there are churches like this, where it's a competition. People are looked down on if they can't afford or aren't wearing expensive or nice clothing. And this makes people feel unwelcome in what we're calling the house of God. This is why now we say, come as you are. It doesn't matter. Now, Here's the thing. If you want to get all dressed up, that's fine if you feel that's honoring to other people around you or to the Lord. But don't make it about you and someone else. 
Don't create a fake standard. And don't look down on anyone based on what they're wearing. Our overseer, Pastor Wayne, he didn't come into or didn't grow up in a Christian household. He came into Christianity late. Maybe he's late teens, early 20s. I don't know the exact date. So when he read what the Bible says church is supposed to be like and saw what church was actually doing, he was kind of surprised. So you know what he did? He went into church with no shoes on just to see what they would do. I think I'm bad. Again, he came in late to Christianity, like I did, coming back from traditional church into Bible-believing church. When you read the New Testament with no cultural overlays, none of our American things, and then you come into a church and see what's going on, it's shocking sometimes. Absolutely shocking. It is so different from the way the Bible says it should be. Remember the Lord's Supper last week if you were here. I was saying to everyone, I really like that kind of environment. I like the casual environment. And I think it's more reflective of the New Testament church. They would worship in homes at first, well, in synagogues at first, because they were Jewish. But when they got persecuted, they would worship in homes. And of course, back then, to have a home, you'd have to have money, especially a home that could fit 30 to 50 people in it. And so they would lounge when they were why should we say worshiping, listening to messages and stuff? They had a triclinium, as I was describing it. Imagine a medieval banquet. And they didn't have chairs like this. They would kind of lounge, and it was kind of relaxed. But something interesting was happening, and we're going to look at it in our Corinthians series. When we get to chapter 11, we're going to see that there was a little bit of a problem. <laughs> you had the wealthy people who owned the homes now having to worship with slaves or servants created a really weird thing. And we'll look at it again in chapter 11. There was a problem, but that's not what we're going to focus on right now. What we're going to focus on is this idea. Think about it. You had slaves and masters as one in Christ, even though they were making mistakes. People who were serving the food before come to the table. Kind of amazing. Galatians 3, 27. All of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. Nor is there male or female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. We are all equal in God's eyes. Acts 17, 26. From one person God created every human nation to live on the whole earth having determined their, determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their lands. One blood, some versions say, probably a King James says, one blood. Regardless of race, sex, social status, or sin, here we are all equal. So, when people weren't behaving as one in Christ Jesus, James has to address it. James 2, starting at verse 1. My brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting or your church. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags or dungarees. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, here's an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person, you were to say, stand over there. Or here, if you want to sit, sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? Dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom? He has promised to those who love him. All of us. James 2.8, he continues. You do well when you really... Fulfill the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. And by that same law, you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Again, in James, we see echoes of Jesus' teachings. 
from the Sermon on the Mount and Proverbs, Proverbs 22, 2. The rich and the poor have this in common. The Lord made them both. At this time, I want to bring Todd and Tracy up for a moment. Those of you who know Todd and Tracy know their ministry, but I want them to uh, join me in describing it here. Check, check, check. Is it working? <laughs> All right, we're not going to be too serious. Thanks, right. man. Good. Right. So I want you to tell everybody how you guys arrived here at C3. Um, we, were, we, we were involved in ministries and different things for years, for about four and a half, five years now. But then um, we were involved in different churches but didn't see uh, where it was headed towards what almost like what Pastor Wayne had saw, like a church that was really doing God's work. So um, this was maybe, what, eight months ago? Yeah. Six months ago? Six months ago, and then we were involved in a church, and that church um, wasn't really following what we, were, what we were thinking. So we ended up Googling one day. We Googled one church. I Googled it, went to this church. Nobody in the family really liked it. So then we, I was like, you know, we really didn't pray about it. That was this church? That, no, that wasn't this <laughs> church. <Okay. laughs> Nobody and liked we, it. And then that, it, was a, it was that weekend, we said, all right, we didn't like that church. Let's pray about it for next week. And we prayed about it, and then we ended up, we weren't looking for a church so much for, like, ministry or anything like that. Just a good God, a church that maybe God, a spirit-filled church. So we Googled again, or I Googled again, and I found C3, and I said, uh, this sounds good. And we listened to Pastor Wayne's, one of his messages, and that sound, it sounded, sounded good. So we said, all right, let's check it. And then since then, we, we came here that one week, and right away we felt very welcome. Everything was, it was like everything we were looking for, because we were looking, we had been through We've been going to church now for 25 years in a lot of different churches, and uh, never had we found a place like this. And um, so that was it. That we, we were actually Seventh Day Adventist in a traditional church. Like yeah, like and you, you had to very dress up. No matter what, I was an very elder, so I was I was frowned upon every single Saturday. Why I wasn't I dressed up? They would sit me down and say, "Todd, you can't stand up." And I'm like, "I'm an elder. You're not. I'm gonna go." You know, and uh, crazy. so it was just crazy how they ran that. But they wanted my clothes to be right. Nothing that I had to say was a big deal was how I looked, which was crazy, but that's what we were stuck in. So we, when I say we came to C3, that's, that's why we were so happy with this church, because it's very different, very and, welcoming. And that was a big thing that, that God had um, put in our heart, and we're so thankful because, like what Pastor Gene was saying, um, you know, we were at a church that talked the talk, but we wanted to be somewhere that walked the walk. And... Um, Lord called us out of there and brought us here and we're very thankful. I'm thankful. <laughs> so just tell everybody about what it is that you do. A lot of people come here, you, you, you know about Breakfast in the Park, but I want you to put a little more, more on that. Well, you can see it right there. This was, um, this was recent, but we had a, a thing like this going four and a half years ago and we did it for about, it was almost a year. And um, it was a ministry. It wasn't really, we didn't, we didn't preach so much. We didn't do things like that. We just simply um, had relationships with people because we felt that was a need. And rather than try to reach them through, hey, here's a Bible, do all this, do all this, we just developed friendships. And through that love is how everything started, not pushing any agendas or anything quite like that. So that was, that was a big part of it. But this was breakfast, and, the, and now what we're doing is, is um, through Pastor Gene and Wayne, we've decided to start breakfast in the park again, but through through C3. So that has been, um, one thing I'd like to say about that is the church we were going to was 350, maybe 400 people. Uh, we had always asked every week, they'd even bring us up here and do a pitch and uh, no one would show. We'd get like one, one volunteer the whole time. And uh, that was, it was kind of discouraging, but at the same time we kept doing it. It was just me and her and a couple other people. And then um, when we came here, our very first breakfast in the park that we started, we've been doing if you guys haven't noticed, we've been doing Breakfast at the Park now for, um, months. yeah, like two months, two months now. And um, the fir very first one, we had probably eight, ten volunteers from this church. So that was awesome for us to see, like, what we were trying to do. We found a church that we didn't even, I didn't even ask God to bring us to a church that wanted to be a part of that. Just more of a church that had a good heart. And sure enough, that's exactly what we found. You know, one thing that I think we talked about last week that I want to address, one major issue when you're doing ministry like this, and this is a very common way of thinking, I think I've been guilty of thinking this way, 
is that when people are in need, it's like, well, just go get a job. <laughs> you know what I mean? Go get, what, they can get a job. Or, you know, what are they going to use the money for? This, this, that, and the other thing. And you and I were talking, and we were saying, you know, nobody wakes up one morning and says, I want to be in this condition. <laughs> you know what I mean? I want to be homeless. Or I want to be living in a tent. Nobody wakes up one day and says that. They're usually what we talked about, victims of a situation. So maybe you can tell us, if, if you can share a story or kind of ha how, I think when you first came in, you really opened my eyes to this, like how this happens. And we talked about um, uh, people needing an operation and then they get hooked on these pain medications. Maybe you can that's, elaborate on that a little more. Yeah, that's one. We've seen a lot of guys where they, I remember a young man, he was 25, hooked on drugs, and he said when he was 23, he got in a bad car accident, got put on a pain medication and never could get off of it. He was on it then forever. And then from then on, he ended up in the streets, really into drugs and all. He said, he goes, I was a good guy and a good family, good education, all that. And he said, uh, I didn't have for any of this. He said, now here I am, stuck, you know. Yep. And he's really stuck. A lot of these guys are just simply stuck. And they, you know, they need that love. Sometimes they didn't get it. Um, um, one more situation, I met a guy, uh, he was, um, Older guy, he had a good company. He said he had a million dollar company, big house, family, and his daughter died of an accident. And like six months later, his wife died of cancer. So then he lost his house, he lost his company, everything, and he was on the streets. And that's, he, was, he didn't ask for that. You know, he just, it happened, you know. Yeah. And imagine if that happened to any one of us. We would want support as well. Yeah, you know? exactly. And sadly, you were saying that was it 50 percent of these people or somewhere around are veterans most of them are veterans yeah. how sad is that yeah. veterans but you were telling me that there was someone out there advocating for them was it la that was last week or just last week? week so there's people out there that are trying to do things we're trying to connect with them so we can rather than do these separate missions try yeah. to team up with these guys and uh, that guy is really into helping veterans mostly he's trying to get housing, they're, they're really a good organization, but we just met him two weeks ago, he came to the breakfast, and he's really wanting to be a part of it. I think he's already talked to some of the guys, so. That's good, yeah, that's good. So far, so good. It's not an easy ministry. No, it's not. We talked about processing loss, Yeah. so you, you lose people. Yeah, we've lost a few guys. In the, over the years, we've lost, um, the last one that bothered us the most was Russell, a young guy, 24, just, he overdosed, so we've, we hear it all the time. We just lost a guy that's come to this church just a few weeks ago. Um, that was, that was a tough one. He's, um, he died of alcohol, and um, he was here just maybe a month ago. Yeah. So. so let us know what your needs are. I know, but some people don't know. What your needs, like what, what do you guys need <clears throat> from our church, from our people? How can everybody be involved in, in one level or another? We're giving this opportunity every Saturday for people to go out but I know you need supplies, you need things. What, what would be good for you? There's so many things. The first thing I just wanted to share with you guys is that, you know, we were going to serve and to help others. And the funny thing is that we're being blessed through this. So if the Lord's tugging on your heart to be a part of it and you kind of just been putting it off, come because you will be blessed. And, um, you know, another thing, like Todd was saying, we were, so, we were so happy to see church members coming. And not only that, but we didn't even have to say anything. They just sat down and spent time with, with others because that's what people need, you know, spending, spending time and showing that you care. I mean, that's a big thing. Another thing is, we, you know, um, we want to get, get a bus. We want to start being able to, because Todd takes his truck out in the morning on Sundays to go um, pick up our friends. And, uh, you know, some of it, a lot of people have to sit in the back of his truck, you know. And th there was a, yeah. actually a police you're, officer that uh, saw him the other day. He had seven people <laughs> in the back of his truck. So, this is being filmed, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also, you know, we have hopes to have um, a, rec a recovery house eventually, you know, start with a men's, maybe have a women's, I don't know, it could be even bigger than that, a community, but there's so many people in, it, you know, there's about 2,000 homeless in Naples. And, I have no idea. That's what they said. Yeah, and there's so many people, you know, they're just trying to get back on their feet, and when you have things like what Todd was saying happen, um, it's really difficult 
to do that, and you need you need that help. You need you know, you know you need that support, and not only in showing that you care, but also financially in different ways. So yeah, you know, yeah. yeah. You know, it's not so much of like you were saying about what did you say, tents or something like that, um, or things. It's not so much of things because it seems like that is happening just fine. It's the presence, uh, people's presence. If you're there, they get um, when we're there. Like you, you don't see it here, but there's there's a couple pictures that I've that we have where people are just, you know, me and Tracy will sit back, because remember, we've been doing this for a while with no help, so to come here and have help is great. We'll sit back and look and see conversations at every table, and that's where the real yeah. ministry is working. That's the ministry yeah. right there. Yeah, and in case you guys don't know, we have meals available after every single Sunday service. Yeah. So people are being fed up there. So if you want, just join. Hang yeah, hang out. Just come and hang out, whether you need a meal or not. So we're trying to do this every Sunday. I'll be talking to different local restaurants and things like that to see what they might want to contribute. But so far, people are bringing food and stuff like that. Um, and on the note of being blessed, why don't we have Jody come up and share with us as well? Don't be shy. <laughs> so, hand <clears throat> her the mic. So why don't you tell us how you arrived here at C3 and how long you've been here? Just fill everybody in. Well, I arrived here at C3 because God wanted me here. Um, he put people in my lives, crossed paths with people that told me I needed to be here and worked on me and worked on me and worked on me, specifically Gail. Um, yeah, <laughs> Gail, great. <laughs> and that's how I how it came to C3. I truly believe this is what I want to be. And you, you, it was confirmed to you to stay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you're like the Apostle Paul being guided by the Holy Spirit. When did you start serving? Tell us about that. Like, because I remember when you first came in, I don't want to throw you under the bus, but we, can, okay, I, can okay. I say that? Yes. Yeah, uh, I, it must have been, you must have been here for no longer than a couple weeks or a month or something like that. So I, I ran across <laughs> Jody in the hallway. I'm like, oh, well, you know, have you met with Pastor Wayne yet? I don't even think I was ordained yet. I'm not sure. Have you met with Pastor Wayne yet? And she's like, no. I was like, you should. She's like, no thanks. You know what I mean? Like, I don't remember your exact words. but So you've gone from that to now you're standing on the stage. Yeah, um, absolutely. So let me first share that um, when you text me, We'll forget that I was driving when I text you back. Man, you guys but are just throwing your... Can we get your last names, please? So, <laughs> <laughs> you know. um, When you texted me and asked me to do this, my first gut response was, like, in front of the whole church. I think that's what you said. It actually. is what I said. <laughs> and um, then I remembered something that I had heard here at C3, and you're supposed to pray before you speak or text. So I wasn't before, but I was after, and I prayed, and I um, said, okay, I'll do this. And you said, if you're uncomfortable, it's okay, you don't have to. And I said, no, I think this is what God wants me to do. It's the next step for me. So talking about the serving, when did I start serving? Um, two months ago? Okay, so just recently. I prayed based on a conversation with my sister. She to me. I said, I don't know what I'm supposed to do next. And she said, well, you should pray about it and maybe volunteer is what you should be doing. So I prayed about it. I talked to people at the church um, and um, talked with Pastor Wayne, you know, Todd, Tracy, and I had started coming to Bible study and that night I walked into Bible study and I saw Todd and I couldn't get up the nerve to ask him about it. I came to Bible study, we did our thing, it was great Bible study, and as I walked out, Tracy was there. And um, I really believe that was God. And Tracy and I started talking, and she said, you know, I know you had an agency interest in this. So that's how I started to serve at Breakfast in the Park. Again, it's God, for sure. Now, you told me a story last week about something really cool that happened. I'll let you share, where people were sharing with each other. <laughs> I told you a lot of stories, but um, yeah, I'll pick one. First, yeah. let me say that um, I went to this, I, I went to serve um, thinking that I was doing something for them and that I was serving them. And, and it's not about that. It's about everything that I get back from them. 
and um, God showing me that, and it's just amazing. Um, from Todd to Tracy to Bob to Chris to Mark to everybody to Matt. Kevin, I mean, I could go on with, with a number of people. Um, I had the pleasure of being able to have the guys with me um, in the car, bring, you know, pick them up and bring them to church. And um, after church, we try to send them away with something for the day. And I was dropping, I was dropping them off at one of the places where we do drop off, and there was another friend of theirs that they knew. And um, Mike walked over and, and handed his food and his water to this gentleman who wasn't going to have any food for the day. And it just blew me away. Honestly, the love and, and serving that these guys do is truly, truly representative of what Jesus wants us to do. Yes. And I have learned like, a ton from you guys and love you guys. <laughs> we love um, having you here. <coughs> you know, fast forward to the, 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 egg, the egg salad story. You know, I walk into work with uh, my lunch from Publix across the street. I'm carrying a bag from Publix, and this gentleman, one of our clients, is standing there, and he says, oh, you brought me lunch. And I said, if, if you want me to, I'll make a egg salad. If you want a sandwich, I'll make you a sandwich. And he said, yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> Honestly, three months ago, I might have just joked around with him about it, and I probably wouldn't have went back, went back to the lunchroom and made him a sandwich and brought it back out to him. And then he sat down and he made that sandwich. So I'd like to believe that I would have three months ago, but I'm not so sure that I would have. Yeah, so it's about that growth within ourselves <clears throat> and then the goal of helping people get back on their feet. I think, Tracy, you were sharing a story about someone named Arlene. Whatever, do you want to share that with everyone? Yeah. We had met Arlene when it, a couple of years ago, and we were actually in Walmart, um, and we were grabbing a tent uh, for her and her boyfriend, and she looked at me, and you could tell, she was just so thankful, and she looked at me, and she said, you know, I wasn't always like this. She said, you know, I was just like you. She said, I had a house, I had a job, I had all these things, and I just lost it. You know, and um, just about, Maybe two months ago, so Todd does a study on Wednesdays um, with, with a bunch of our friends um, at the Pizza Hut, uh, a bunch of the guys. And um, I used to do a women's, and I was trying to start getting the women's group going again. And I had some women say yes, but weren't really committed to it. And I was going out and just in the community. And um, I was at the Pizza Hut before, and uh, I was praying, and I was just saying, Lord, you know, I just want to help these women. I, I, I don't know, you know, how you want to use me. I want to help these women. And um, the Holy Spirit led me to go back out, and I ended up seeing Arlene that we had seen about two years ago, and she looked very different. Um, she had gained weight. She looked very healthy, um, uh, very happy, had a job, was, was doing well. And, and honestly, that was God answering my prayer, like, hey, look at, you know, look at this woman and look at what the Lord had been doing in her life and how I was able to be a part of that. So, and right after that prayer, he showed me that and it was just such a blessing. It's, a, it's, a, it's so awesome to see people that we care about because we're all friends and we're all, you know, it's no partiality, you know, we care, we're a family, you know? And, um, you know, just like Todd, Todd had said, and, and um, when we've lost, you know, friends, you know, they're part of our family, and it's, it's, um, it's difficult. And to see when people that we care about, when they're doing better, and seeing what God's doing in their life, not only uh, blessing them with um, things as far as, you know, um, getting a home or these things, but also what God's doing, most importantly, spiritually in their lives, is such a blessing and an honor to be able to be a part of it. Yeah, so it's about the growth. It's not just about... Staying where you are, those are the questions that most people who don't do that kind of ministry will ask. You know, it's, they, they might see it as a perpetual state. That's not the goal here. We want to bring them into the family. We want to get them well. All right? So it's really important that you guys understand what we're trying to do here. This is a part of real church, real people, where anyone can come as they are. We've all got our stuff. It doesn't matter. Where you can take that mask off and be yourself. You can get prayer. 
But we want to love our neighbors. We want to love our community as best as we can. And so, you know, I'm glad, more than glad, to, to, to partner with Todd and Tracy and give them the tools that they need uh, to be the hands and feet of Jesus in our community. Uh, so let's just take a moment and let, let's pray for them. Um, <clears throat> and everyone who's serving, Lord, I just want to pray for Todd and Tracy, for their marriage, for their life, for their son, Michael, and everything that they're doing as they go out into the community as the hands and feet of Jesus. May you put it on our hearts to adequately supply their needs and also to become a part of what they're doing, to be the church along with them in their local mission here, which is extremely important. Lord, I pray that the community sees our love. I pray that the love of Christ would just flow from us through the things that we're doing so that through our deeds, people can see our love, can recognize us as Christians, knowing what we're all about. And when they have needs, they know where to come. They can come here to us so that we have the opportunity to share love with them. Lord, I thank you so much for all these wonderful people. Your body, Lord, your church, keep blessing us with more. Who have hearts that want to serve and be like Jesus. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. I love you.